Hello, and welcome to Makeshift Stories. Thank you for listening. You can help us out by telling your friends about us or writing a review on your favorite podcast service. Now, open your imagination and take a journey into the improbable as you listen to Makeshift Stories 159, Ken Likely, Accidental Interdimensional Drifter in Pocket Universe, read by Mitchell Two. As it hurtled through the nothingness, the worry bead, at least that is how Ken, the stone's most recent owner, thought of it, and what the stone understood its current purpose to be, beyond some vague geologic function, came to the conclusion that non-existence was a very boring state to be in. Up to the current moment, it had considered the nature of reality was something physical, a constant beyond itself, which existed whether it was present or not. However, a new idea suddenly occurred to the rock. Was reality a product of consciousness, or was consciousness created by reality? It was enough of a muddle to give even a rock a headache. What it knew for certain was at first it had been a piece of limestone strata, which had broken away from a fold mountain through the action of frost, then pushed down some long-forgotten stream, tumbling and bumping into stuff, mostly other rocks, until it became a smooth, round, oval-shaped stone. And although it took 50 million years to accomplish, that was quite enough for a rock to keep it busy and distract it from contemplating the meaning of existence, the nature of reality, and the rise of economics as the current dominant force in the evolution of the planet. Although, it briefly considered the wisdom of investing in mutual funds, but quickly, for a rock, realized its financial advisor's commissions would eat up most of its gains. However, the latter force had the greatest impact in its 100 million year life, ensuring it was scooped up from the ancient dried up riverbed, unceremoniously dumped into a gravel truck, and delivered to Ken Likely's parents' backyard, where it was destined to become part of the foundation for a new patio. There, a ten-year-old Ken took a fancy to it. He liked the feel of its cool, smooth surface, an almost perfect oval shape, and plopped it into his housecoat pocket, where it happily stayed, for almost an eye blink on the geologic scale of things. Ken rolled it between his fingers every time he was anxious, which was quite frequent before it found itself tossed into a void as a sounding stone, an action provoked by Ken's anxiety and worry. It said to the nothingness, not considering the consequences after all, there was Zippo around it to be concerned with, and it was starting to favor the universe as a mental construct argument anyway. Let there be... Um... It couldn't quite formulate what it was thinking, And quite frankly, this was the first time the stone had attempted to generate anything resembling a thought. Only one idea emerged. Me. Yes. Let there be me. Then Ken's anxiety struck, seeking confirmation. Was me a good idea? Maybe it should have waited for a better concept. Then again... If it had to wait another hundred million years for its next thought, that would be a really, really boring long time. So it settled on me. Yes. Let there be me. The stone confirmed to the nothingness. Me being everything which Ken, its former owner, had imprinted on it over the years. Plus, its own concerns about the next geological period. Yes! It repeated with enthusiasm now that it was getting the hang of thinking and talking. Let there be me. Really. That's what I want. But a residue of resentment from being thrown heartlessly into the void to test the depth of nothingness slid in at the last moment. He should have known, the stone growled, as the universe exploded into existence around it, and the stone fell into Leaf Basil's bed of prized chamomile which lined the hippie's backyard fence. Leaf had just put the finishing touches on his new composter when he noticed Planet, his dog and colleague, sniffing at something in the flower bed along the back fence. She seemed way too interested in what was there, 
like dogs do before they decide to ingest or mark something, which grosses out their human companions. So Leaf decided to intervene. She had been examining a small polished stone, which Leaf recognized immediately and snatched away. Hey, planet, that's Ken's worry bead, or rock, or whatever, man. One powerful talisman, so you gotta be careful. Give it respect. It's not something to mark. Didn't expect it to come back after the man tossed it into the void of nothingness. What do you think is up, man? Planet tilted her head and stared at Leaf. Okay, okay, I get it. I get it already. Nothing looks different, but that's totally surface, man. That rock shouldn't be here. Or maybe it isn't, and we're just... Oh, man, I don't dig where that thought's going. Starts getting into the whole what is real groove. Way too heavy for backyard gardening. And that whole mind-bending ontological trip. I don't want to get down with that stuff, planet. But what do you think? We're in a gnarly mess here? Let's go for a walk and find out. Planet yipped and wagged her tail. Leaf put his tools away and let Planet out the gate. Whoa, man. Some mega awesome lawn service must have come through here last night. All the grass is so, so plastic. There's not even one rogue blade, like, anywhere. Leaf noted as Planet stopped to explore the aromatics of one of her favorite lampposts. She stared at it, confused. Nothing, she yipped. I marked this post last night, and now it smells like pine-scented disinfectant. There's no undertones, no residues, nothing. Whoa, that's not a good sign, man. Things are a bit too plastic to be cool. Look at the sky. Bet I could guess its Pantone number. We could check out the convenience store, man, and jaw with a few people to make sure we're not just tripping. Planet and Leaf rubbernecked their way along their usual route. Every hedge was trimmed. Every house looked like it had been photoshopped from a home and garden magazine, pixels so fresh that the paint looked wet. There wasn't even a crack in the roads or the smallest chip in the rounded, tripping hazard reduced curbs. There was no one around, but not in the usual way no one was around, but watching out their windows. The place looked like an abandoned set for a 1950s home insurance ad, all glossy and catalog perfect. Leaf's suspicions grew. This, this really, really ain't hit, Planet. No, man, I'm worried. Planet growled at a community trash bin painted with white daisies on a cerulean blue background that looked like it had never been used. Then they hit the wall, literally, when they arrived at the end of the main street into their burb. Where the traffic lights used to be, there was a closed gate high enough that Leaf and Planet couldn't see beyond it. Guess there won't be any more late-night hoagie sandwich runs to the 24-7 mark for Ken. Leaf craned his head back to see the top of the wall, which hadn't been there yesterday. Maybe that's good for him, but I'm getting a creepy feeling this is the edge of Squaresville, and I mean the real edge, man, with, like, Zippo beyond it. Leaf, even I can't tell. Planet yipped pawing and sniffing at the wall with obvious concern. It comes down to the fundamental question, doesn't it, Leaf? Right on. I know it's not cool to question the gig. This day-glow reality is our thing. But I'm feeling like a brain in a vat right now. We gotta connect with Kenny Planet and see if the man's down with this, or if he's just another vat brain. That's not really the fundamental question I was thinking of. Planet complained, then turned to walk back the way they had come, but found her path blocked by a rather intimidating man who towered over them. You two going someplace? Huh? He accused in a deep baritone, which made Lee feel like he had just been caught shoplifting a candy from the convenience store. 
Noticing the words Neighborhood Bylaw Watch emblazoned in yellow on the giant man's black t-shirt, Leaf immediately added, Hey, Clyde, my man! My dog here and me are just out for a walk. We scoop, so there's nothing wrong here. Look, these are my biodegradable poop bags. Leaf pulled a few out of one pocket. Planet moaned with embarrassment. Destined for the composter, like the bylaw says. Just finished building my own, man. Trying to help the system, you know? Leaf added. The man raised an eyebrow. Where do you live? Whoa, man. No need to go all establishment on us. Just because you got a Renifuzz t-shirt on, don't mean you can go all heavy on folks. Leaf pointed out. Planet growled. Yeah, Planet, I agree with you. This Clyde's not hip at all. A personal composter? You can't have a composter in your yard. The big guy grumbled. Leaf stared at him, searching his memory. There was something familiar about this Clyde. Planet came to the same conclusion and yipped. Oh, yeah, you're right, Planet. And that's just too unreal to be a coincidence. Talking to your dog's not going to get you out of your fine for breaking community laws, the man threatened. Leaf continued to stare at him, then snapped his fingers. You're, uh, um, what's his face, aren't you? The guy who used to bully Ken when you two were kids. It's Cody, right? Cody Anderson? Something bumped into Leaf's back, making him jump, which was an unusual reaction for the chilled vegan. Equally unusual, the wall had snuck up behind him, so it was touching Leaf's heels. Suspecting this was not the way a wall should behave, Leaf said anxiously, Hey, man, that's freaking weird. Is that thing moving? If it is, we got bigger fish to fry than some freaking community composting bylaw. Cody mumbled something unintelligible, pulled a pad of carbonless forms out of a pocket in his beige cargo pants, then moved menacingly closer to Leaf. What was your name again? Time to split, planet, Leaf suggested in a tone which implied in no uncertain terms they should run. As he dodged around Cody and broke into a sprint, Leaf swore he saw the wall move again this time consuming all the branches on one side of a cartoonishly perfect oak tree. Leaf picked up the pace. Ken was going through the minutes from his last community association meeting, fixing typos and correcting the facts to agree with his sense of the way things should be, when the doorbell rang. He didn't like being disturbed when he was working, and was doing his best to ignore the pesky ringing, hoping whomever it was would just go away when he saw Cody running down the street toward his house and cringed. Cody had been Ken's boyhood nemesis, a bully who had once ripped Ken's favorite stone out of his hand in the playground and thrown it away. It had taken Ken two weeks to find it again. He instinctively shivered, then remembered he was the president of the association, and Cody was just a volunteer lout with the newly formed Community Bylaw Compliance Subcommittee. The doorbell ringing seemed to grow in intensity as the lout approached. His concentration already blown, which put Ken in a surly mood, he reluctantly opened the door to find Leaf, his annoying neighbor and weird dog, anxiously checking over their shoulders. Hey, hey, Kenny, my man! Leaf began with an urgent edge Ken generally didn't associate with the aging hippie. Long time no see. Uh, I hate to be pushy, but we got a jaw on some heavy stuff, like... Now, Ken's neighbor nervously looked back again at the seven-foot-tall Cody, now only three houses away and picking up speed. I know this may sound weird, but the urgency is only partly about the human 18-wheeler about to compost planet in me. For some reason, that Clyde is really ticked off. But there's something out of sight around here, and not in a cool way, man. You gonna let us in, Kenny? Ken held up one hand. Hey, Cody, it's okay. I can handle this. The giant stopped just short of the stairs, gasping for breath. Are you sure? 
Mr. Likely. Ken nodded, and Cody looked crestfallen. Leaf eyed the man suspiciously as he and Planet edged into Ken's house. Dude, you need to exercise more. Man, get down with some organic chow and chill before your veins pop. Leaf added over his shoulder. Cody growled again, then turned away. I didn't think you and the Clyde are tight, Kenny. Wasn't he the one who threw your favorite rock away when you were ten or something? That was decades ago, Leaf. And besides, we're on the community association board now. He enjoys bylaw enforcement, I do paperwork. Complimentary roles, you see. We rarely deal with each other. Ken tried to sound casual, but there was enough tension in his voice to suggest he didn't have any choice in the matter and didn't really like the arrangement. Cody texted me before you got here. You know you can't compost in your backyard, Leaf. It smells and attracts nasty bugs and stuff. Not if it's done right, man. You just need to balance, Planet barked. So, sorry, Planet. I know. Focus, right? I was just getting all bummed out about the spy law stuff. Leaf apologized, then turned to Ken, who stood impatiently rolling his worry stone in one hand. Leaf eyed the stone. Kenny, my man, I'm glad you and the rock connected. Planet found it in the chamomile bed this morning. Now, don't go all hairy again and throw that cat into another void, man. We're in a big enough heap as it is. Leaf, it's, it's, well, you can't just willy-nilly build a composter in your backyard, Ken pointed out. I'm solid with that, for now, but under protest. You're forcing me to go the city establishment route, and I'll... Planet growled at him. Okay, okay, chill, Planet. I'm getting to it, man. Hey, haven't you noticed how things are, um, a bit, uh... I hate saying this, dude, but aren't things a bit too, you know, Ken-like around here? I have no idea what you're talking about, Leaf, which is par for the course. You're just trying to evade the issue. There is no composting allowed. It's on page 155 of the new community guidelines. No, man, I'm totally solid with that, but... Blah, 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 Planet interrupted impatiently. Ken stared at her, jaw on the floor, his knuckles turning white from squeezing the stone. Yes, Ken, we've talked before. Well, in different manifestations of what your tiny brain thinks of as reality. And each time you have that same stupid look on your face. It's getting quite tiring. But that's besides the point. Right now, we haven't got much time. Yeah, man, the wall. When did that thing happen? We approved it last meeting to stop the pizza delivery cars from cutting through the neighborhood at breakneck speeds. Leaf looked embarrassed. Oh, I skipped out. Those meetings are always a downer and hassle, man. Okay, I can get down with the pizza thing, full of GMO ingredients, fat, salt. Not good for you at all, man. But Ken, dude, the wall's blocking more than pizza, and it's closing in. The smaller the perimeter, the easier it is for Cody to patrol. We voted on that, too. A couple of deliveries were still getting through, and there were the rabbits, too. Rabbits? From the empty lot, they're leaving droppings everywhere. You two, stop! Planet growled. Listen up! Ken, where do you think you are? Uh, here? At home? Where else would I be? No, Ken, think bigger. If your ape brain can handle that, where is here? Planet barked impatiently. Obviously, someplace dogs can talk. Obviously, I'm either hallucinating that I'm talking to a dog, or I'm having a lucid dream, or something. That's a great start, Planet encouraged. Some consider reality to be a dream or an illusion created by our brain to interpret the world. It's a good theory with a long history. Goes all the way back to Plato, Aristotle, and more recently, Descartes. So where do you think we are, Ken? Uh, um... Ken considered for a moment, then shrugged. Okay, I get it. Leaf, when did you become such a great ventriloquist? I'm obviously at home and awake. 
He thumped the wall with one hand. On terra firma, solving this community's problem and keeping us all safe. You don't hear any pizza delivery cars zooming through the streets anymore, do you? You're just trying to mess with my mind. So I'll forget about your bylaw infringing composter. Nice try, but it won't work. Mellow out and think, Kenny, Leaf suggested. Have you noticed things are... are, well... Okay, man, I'm just gonna lay it on you straight up. This is an ego trip, and it's your ego. Actually, it's the ego stuff you rubbed in that rock of yours. Like, there's only four of us here, dude. The only four who've touched the thing. We're its entire universe, man, and that's freaky. There was a loud scraping sound, like something heavy being dragged across concrete. Leaf turned and looked out Ken's open front door. This is a bad scene, man, and it's getting worse. I can see the wall from here now. Ken looked around Leaf and smiled. That's great news. I think we just got rid of the stray cat problem and the threat of Dutch elm disease once all the elms end up on the other side. There's an elm in my front yard, Kenny. Leaf pointed to a large tree almost touching his house. Yup, Ken noted nonchalantly. And if you don't remove your composter, the wall can solve that issue as well. Um, my pad, Ken. Dude, my, my pad will be where everything else we don't want in the neighborhood is, not here. But, Kenny, the other side is Zippo City, right? Ken looked confused. I don't understand. What's this other side you speak of, Leaf? This is everything. He waved his hands around the living room. I'm just doing my job protecting the neighborhood. Like getting rid of... Hmm. What did I say we got rid of recently? Pizza delivery cars? Planet suggested. Pizza what? Ken scratched his head. Planet tugged at Leaf's pant leg to get his attention. Leaf knelt down. What is it? It's his anxiety. It's out of control. It'll turn on everything and eliminate it until all that's left is him. What do we do about it? Planet tilted her head to think. If Ken stopped believing this was real, it might pop this pocket reality. Okay, man. As Leaf stood up, there was another loud scraping sound. He looked out the front window and saw, to his horror, that the wall had consumed the half of his house where the tree had stood. Ken was mumbling something about invasive wildflowers he had spotted the day before, and the wall inched slowly forward, ingesting Leaf's newly planted bed of echinacea. Hey, Kenny! You ever contemplate the nature of the real man? You know, like that Descartes cat? I think therefore I am. Cogito ergo sum. That kind of thing. It's a whole head trip. The cat meant you can't reduce things further because you can't doubt the doubt because you're the dude doing the doubting. Kind of makes you think, right? Like, maybe this is all made up. Can't say I've spent much time thinking about it, Leaf. There's more practical stuff to worry about, like neighbors recklessly planting invasive flower species, or building smelly composters. Composters don't smell, man. Leaf objected, then looked to Planet for support. His logic leaves room for improvement, Planet noted sarcastically. Ken, try this. Imagine that you, or more accurately, the anxiety you've rubbed into that rock created a reality for itself. What would that look like? Ken stopped rolling the rock in his hand and tried to place it discreetly on the hallway table. Think about it. You toss your favorite rock into the void last week. There's something called the Copenhagen Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics, which more or less states nothing exists until it's observed. So, Think of that void as a wave function, just math, really. And when your rock entered it, your anxieties observed where they were and collapsed the wave from multiple possibilities to a single position, to this place. Yeah, man, Leaf cut in. Ken, dude, this is, this is your head trip, man. Yours and the negative Eastmo anxieties you laid on that rock. Ken shrugged again. Leaf 
You're not making any sense, as usual. And, well, I generally make it a rule not to take too much stock in a dog's ruminations on the nature of reality. Did you know you've got mice living under your greenhouse, Ken? We gotta get rid of those things. They carry nasty diseases. Remember the plague? The wall outside slid up to the fence between Leaf and Ken's yards. Oh, my greenhouse! Leaf moaned. Okay, dude, you gotta chill. Don't think of any more bummer stuff that makes your head go all creepo. You need to use herbicides, Leaf. Oh, man. Not now, dude. Think of something else. Leaf pleaded. Digging those dandelions out isn't working. They're halfway across my lawn, and it's still early spring. The sun seemed to disappear behind a cloud. Ken looked out the window and saw only wall. Okay, Kenny. Seriously, just chill. No more weeds, Ken smirked. Ken! Planet barked. You've got to stop believing this is real. In desperation, Leaf grabbed the spiral-bound community guidelines Ken had been clutching and flipped through them, then jabbed at something on page 155 and smiled. Hey, Kenny, I'm perusing the guidelines, man, and I'm looking at backyard developments. There's nothing in here about composting. Ken turned in astonishment. Really? Let me see that. He grabbed the book back and scanned the page Leaf was on. Wait, backyard is hyphenated. I'd never do that. Suddenly, realization spread across Ken's face. The stone found itself falling through darkness again, if indeed it's possible to fall where there is nothing else in existence, pondering the nature of existence. I think, therefore, I... Oh! It realized, then decided to experiment. It stopped thinking and immediately disappeared. Makeshift Stories is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, powered by ATB Financial. To listen to other great APN podcasts, such as Emily Missed Out or Creative Block, please head over to albertapodcastnetwork.com. This episode was brought to you by Park Power, a provider of electricity and natural gas in Alberta that offers low rates, awesome service, and profit sharing with local charities. In Alberta, you get to choose who to buy your energy from. Park Power has low overhead, and chances are you'll save money if you switch. You can find out how much money you would save by visiting parkpower.ca and plugging your numbers into the Alberta Energy Savings Calculator. If you decide to switch, it's easy. Nothing changes about your service, only the price you pay. Learn more at parkpower.ca. Makeshift Stories is released twice a month around the 1st and the 15th. This month's story was written by Alan V. Hare and read by Mitchell Two. Opening and closing theme, Magical Mystery by 8th Mode Music, is licensed from Audio Jungle on a music mass reproduction license. If you'd like to connect with us, please send an email to makeshiftstories at gmail.com or visit our website at makeshiftstories.com. Links to both are in the show notes. You can help us out by writing a review on Stitcher Radio or Apple Podcasts or any of your favorite podcast services. Makeshift Stories is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial attribution no derivative license, which means you are free to share our stories. Just remember to credit us and don't alter anything.